We are now up to part seven in our story about Disney artist Herb Ryman, a man who worked on Disney films and later transformed the Disney parks. Already we've looked at his childhood, his experience at MGM, his journey across Europe and Asia, and his first attempt to define himself as a fine arts painter. When we left off last time, Ryman had returned to MGM only to find that the studio had changed in ways that troubled him. And then, at the urging of a friend, he'd taken a position at the Disney studio. And that is exactly where we start today. In the fall of 1938, the Disney studio on Hyperion Avenue was bursting with people. It was a small studio initially designed to produce cartoon shorts that was now creating feature-length films. Their first feature, Snow White, had been the center of studio activity for three years. After its success, Walt didn't simply want to target a second feature. He put multiple projects into production. Some artists worked on the concert feature, later called Fantasia, others on Pinocchio, a few developed ideas for Bambi, a story set in a forest about the life of a young deer. Around these feature projects, the studio still released a line of six-minute cartoons. That year, the studio, on average, released one every three weeks. Workspace at the Hyperion lot was cramped and crowded. Long ago, Disney had outgrown its core buildings. To accommodate more artists, it had purchased nearby houses, apartment buildings, and bungalows, converting kitchens, living rooms, and bedrooms into space for artists. Lead animators often worked alongside assistant animators, all of them squeezed into the same room. Newly hired artists found a desk, an easel, or a drafting table wherever they could. In these makeshift buildings, doors were often removed not only to create more space, but also to allow artists to move more easily from one work area to the next. In many buildings, the organization was haphazard and unplanned. One room might contain a background painter, the next an effects animator, and the next a story artist. If animators wanted to sit in on a story meeting, they were free to do so. If story artists wanted to spend time in the room of a layout artist, they could do that as well. For Ryman, the Disney operation was entirely unlike MGM, with its well-lit drawing tables and strong delineation of roles. This was a new experience for me, Ryman said. Not only were studio buildings organized in a casual fashion, the work culture was casual as well. Before at MGM, I was called Mr. Ryman, and all of a sudden I'm Herb or Herbie, he said. He was encouraged to dress less formally. Hardly anyone wore a coat while working, and most everyone rolled up their sleeves. From the start, he understood that the casual culture was indicative of something larger, a work philosophy that distinguished Disney from MGM. On its lot, MGM wanted to present an image of prestige. But Disney was scrappy, the underdog looking to compete with better-funded live-action studios. Walt thought you'd get more work done in a friendly family atmosphere than by a strict business approach, Ryman said. Walt's premise for accomplishment was not how you're dressed or how you looked. It was what you can do that was important. Initially, Ryman visualized his role at the studio as being similar to Gustav Tengren, an experienced artist who defined the look of an entire feature. Ryman believed that he would be able to adapt his experience with sketching and watercolors, both from his own work and from his work at MGM, into a style that would define a Disney feature. But Ryman discovered that concept designs for an animated film were different than those arranged for a live-action feature. I took the job there at the Walt Disney Studio, and I think a great deal was expected of me. They thought maybe I could do something like Tengren or Kai Nielsen, and I failed miserably because I didn't have that background. His professional experience was far more centered in works of realism than in works of illustration or fantasy. 
In terms of concept work, then, he had little to offer Disney. Much to his surprise, Disney didn't fire him. Instead, studio managers looked for a role where Ryman would succeed. They looked me over, Ryman said. They put me to work immediately in story development on the Pleasure Island sequence in Pinocchio. As opposed to concept design, story artists developed a narrative to guide the plot rather than visuals to define its look. At MGM and with live action theater, we had a script, Ryman explained. For instance, in A Tale of Two Cities, Charles Dickens wrote a very good story. What we had to do was illustrate that story. At Disney, he found story artists didn't adapt a book for the screen so much as use elements in it to create a new story arranged for animation. We improvised, Ryman explained, and we invented as we went along. We had no script. We developed our own story, and it got changed considerably. In working on Pinocchio, Ryman saw that story artists omitted large sections of the original novel, choosing instead to focus on a few characters and a few plot ideas as the basis for a film story. The goal was to create narrative elements inspired by the book that fit the form of animation. If you've ever read Pinocchio, Ryman explained, you'd know that the Disney version was not like the original story. Walt changed it quite a bit, and we put a lot of personality into a little wooden puppet that turned into a real-life boy. The story team invented the character of Jiminy Cricket. In the novel, the unnamed Talking Cricket first appeared in Chapter 4, where he told Pinocchio that because he had a head of wood, he was foolish not to obey Geppetto. A moment later, angered by this rebuke, Pinocchio threw a carpenter's mallet at the cricket, killing him. The talking cricket, except for brief appearances as a ghost, never made it into Chapter 5. In the Disney version, however, the cricket not only has a name, but follows Pinocchio as his companion and conscience from the start of the story to its close. As opposed to sketch artists at MGM, story artists at Disney often worked in pairs or as part of a team. Typically, they outlined a story sequence, then broke the narrative down into individual moments which were represented with drawings and a line or two of dialogue. The drawings were push-pinned to a corkboard so their order could be altered until the sequence had flow and rhythm. One of Ryman's fellow artists, Homer Brightman, explained... Animated cartoons were not written, but told with sketches, and the story man had to explain his story after he had drawn it out for Walt. Once on the board, story sequences were presented to other members of the story department, along with Walt, for critique and revision, until a sequence was approved for layout. Along with this new style of storytelling, Ryman observed that story artists who were among the highest paid on the lot also took the casual attitude of Disney to new depths. When it was hot, the guys would sit around without their jackets and without their shirts, and sometimes even without their shoes, Ryman explained. At first, I thought they were doing it to get my goat, that they were teasing me. But they weren't doing it to tease me. It was how they were. The first sequence on which Ryman worked followed Pinocchio as the coachman took him to Pleasure Island, where naughty boys, due to their rowdy behavior, were turned into donkeys. The sequence was later known as Pleasure Island, but as Ryman began work, it was still referred to as Booby Land or, alternatively, Lazy Land. Months earlier, Booby Land had been envisioned as an island where boys simply overate with endless buffets of cakes and cookies, as well as trees that produce candy instead of fruit. Walt suggested that Pinocchio be greeted rather ominously with the slogan, The more you eat, the more you enjoy yourself, the quicker you turn into a booby, which was a code word on the island that meant a donkey. But as work progressed, Walt pushed the sequence to hold even darker tones. Instead of overeating, the boys should be drawn to brawls, vandalism, beer, and cigars. At one point, Walt suggested that there be a bonfire specifically, so the boys could toss in their school books with menacing glee. Even with this, Walt wasn't satisfied. 
The booby land sequence remained on the boards all through 1938, with new ideas being added each week. Ryman almost surely was brought in as a fresh set of eyes to offer new ideas for a sequence that had stalled out in revision. I worked on Lampwick and Pinocchio shooting pool and smoking cigars, he said. He developed possibilities with others in the story department, such as Otto Englander and Ed Penner, striving to find additional notes of darkness to deepen the overall tonal boundaries of the story. In terms of a narrative progression, the underlying problem was this. Early in the film, Pinocchio is kidnapped by Stromboli, a wicked puppet master who keeps him locked in a birdcage while pretending that they are partners. The later sequence, set on Pleasure Island, needed to be significantly darker and more disturbing than those scenes arranged in Stromboli's wagon. Audiences would simply grow bored if the level of danger didn't increase dramatically as the story progressed. For this assignment, the story team was left alone to work up stronger ideas that would reveal the true nature of the boys sent to the island. Walt didn't come around much at that period, Ryman explained. Even while settling in to his new role, Ryman continued to miss the culture of MGM, where men wore suit jackets and artists approached a film with the belief that movies if well-produced, might be regarded with the respect typically given to literary novels. Beyond this, he was aware that the formality of MGM had invited him to think of himself as belonging to an esteemed group of filmmakers. I miss the days when I was Mr. Ryman, he said. At Disney, I was Herb or Herbie or Hoib. No one, not even Walt, arrived to work with the elegance of Cedric Gibbons, dressed in a perfectly tailored shirt with a folded handkerchief rising up from his coat pocket. The guys were very informal, Ryman explained, and I had to come down off of this necktie and shirt thing of MGM. He also understood that Disney offered him a unique experience. MGM, along with every other live-action studio, developed projects around actors and actresses, and to a lesser extent the director and producer. But at Disney, projects were developed primarily around artists. These artists, or at least many of them, were a little rough around the edges. At time, they drank beer in the afternoon, which was tolerated at the studio. They played jokes on each other. They passed around an endless stack of gag drawings to make each other laugh. I liked them, Ryman said, and I wanted them to like me, so I worked hard. One of the most difficult lessons concerned the disposability of art. At MGM, Ryman's sketches had been valued and preserved, at least until filming of a picture was complete. At Disney, art was everywhere, pinned to every board, stacked on every table, and piled up on every pegboard. As such, it was less valuable. While working on Pinocchio, story artists produced scores of drawings each day to visualize how a sequence might play out on screen. Initially, Ryman produced drawings with perspective and fine lines, such as he had at MGM. I did the best I could, he said. But he saw how drawings, once a scene was changed, were wadded up and tossed into the wastebasket. It was somewhat of a shock to me to see how ruthlessly temporary these little drawings were, Ryman explained. They'd get yanked off and thrown in the wastebasket or thrown on the floor. In the beginning, I was very hurt to think that my dear precious little drawings, which I thought were pretty good, were just yanked off and thrown in the wastebasket. This was the process, and I was educated, so I learned to make the kind of drawing that was not so tediously, scrupulously, diligently precious. I made a drawing that was instantly visualized, so there was no loss when it was changed to another drawing. At night, he continued to teach at Chenard, where, rather oddly, he explained to students how to be a sketch artist, which was a job he no longer held. At Disney, he continued to learn the nuance of story beats, the narrative rhythms of drawings arranged across a corkboard. He also met Walt, though oddly it wasn't in the story department, as apparently other things were presently occupying him at the moment. He met him in the courtyard while walking between buildings. I'm Herb Ryman, he said. I haven't met you, but I'm happy to make your acquaintance.
The two men shook hands, then Walt took him in with his gaze, as though he knew suddenly who he was. I hope you like it here, Walt said. We have some good plans for the future. I understand that you have an excellent background, and I hope we can work together. It was then that Ryman realized that Walt not only knew who he was, but also understood his history at MGM. I hope so too, Ryman said. Not long after that, Ryman was shifted from Pinocchio to another film then in production, the one that would eventually be released as Fantasia. The development of Fantasia was different than that of Snow White, Pinocchio, or even Bambi. All of those features had started with a published story, either a novel or a fairy tale, which the story team developed into a visual script. The origin of Fantasia had begun with a single short subject, a two-reel cartoon that Walt believed would elevate the status of Mickey Mouse during a period when Donald Duck was a bigger draw in theaters. Initially, Walt conceived of a musical short that presented Mickey acting out a story arranged into Paul Duca's symphony, The Sorcerer's Apprentice. The music for the symphony was inspired by a poem about a wayward apprentice who, once the sorcerer leaves him alone, attempts to perform magic to disastrous results. For this project, the Disney story team simply adapted the poetic narrative in such a way that it fit Mickey's personality, a story that was then combined with Duca's symphony. But as the project developed, Walt sensed that The Sorcerer's Apprentice might have a larger life in theaters, that it might be one segment of a feature film configured around classical music. Walt didn't want to put The Sorcerer's Apprentice out in the shorts market, so that in itself was a big factor in the creation of Fantasia, explained studio manager Ben Sharpstein. If Walt could do that with The Sorcerer's Apprentice, then he could do it with other pictures. So why couldn't he make a vaudeville show? Why couldn't he put them all together? Why couldn't it be a concert? A feature if it was well-received, had the possibility to take in more money than a dozen shorts or even three dozen. Beyond this, Walt believed that tasteful animation, if artly paired with classical music, would elevate Disney animation far above its cartoon origins. According to Disney artist Joe Grant, Walt felt that the studio I should begin to grow up now. By using the classics, that would give us a little more status. If all worked out, Fantasia would not only demonstrate the versatility and range of animation, it would demonstrate that a Disney feature could be as sophisticated as anything produced by MGM or Fox. For these reasons, Walt decided to create a feature by combining a series of short segments keyed to classical music. Different segments would ideally present a range of narrative and artistic styles, but in this there was one small problem. The symphony, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, as it had been based on a narrative poem, arrived with a story to guide its on-screen drama for the mouse. For other segments, Disney artists would need to develop a story or at least a visual presentation that would pair perfectly with a famous symphony. For this film, Ryman was assigned to the Pastoral Symphony by Beethoven, an assignment he worked on with his old friend Ken Anderson. The symphony, they soon learned, expressed the joys of being in the country with tones of folk music and sections that expressed both the trouble and peace found in nature. We'd play the pastoral all day long, all the movements, Ryman said. But unlike a novel or a fairy tale, the symphony didn't contain characters or even a narrative. It primarily expressed a mood, the joy of arriving in the country, the satisfaction of sitting beside a brook, and the temporary chaos of an evening storm. Nobody knew what the hell to do with it, Ryman said. We were supposedly going to translate Beethoven's thoughts. They needed direction, which ultimately came from Walt. According to Walt, a story for this symphony might be arranged as a Mount Olympus comic opera. 
With this, story teams develop sequences arranged around a mythological setting, with centaurs, winged horses, unicorns, and finally the gods themselves. The Disney version retained Beethoven's interest in the country, only it was mythological creatures who enjoyed an afternoon in the woods, not people. During this phase, Ryman continued to focus on story. I worked on different sequences, doing stylization and story sketches. For a while, he focused on the latter sections of the symphony, a musical storm during which, in the Disney version, the gods made an appearance in the clouds. Herbie would draw a story sketch of the arms of Zeus, Ken Anderson recalled. They were really fantastic. But then Ryman's role at the studio began to change. As though that short meeting with Walt had jogged his memory as to how Ryman might better be situated at the studio, Ryman soon found himself working with layout artists. In addition to Ken Anderson, he worked with longtime layout artists such as Charlie Filippi and Hugh Hennessy. I also did quite a few layouts of backgrounds with Hugh Hennessy, a genius with a pencil, he said. And this studio managers finally guided Ryman into a role that was the animation equivalent of sketch artist at MGM. Instead of creating drawings to position actors and sets for a live-action film, Ryman now created drawings that mapped out the placement of animated characters and painted backgrounds, a precise presentation of how a scene, when finished, should appear on screen. Along with basic staging, he also had to plan out the line of action between the animated characters and the background material, so that movement was easy to read on screen. This was a new task for him, but he took to it quickly as it relied on skills he had developed at MGM. As he grew comfortable at the studio, he started to know Walt, if only a little, as a person. Walt had a very affectionate, ingratiating smile, Ryman said. He could look at you and talk to you, and he had an almost hypnotic enthusiasm. But this, Ryman sensed, wasn't the key factor that brought Disney success. Rather, it was another quality. Somewhat like Irving Thalberg, Walt had the ability to understand the tastes of the American audience. Whereas Thalberg had developed this skill by observing how an average American audience responded to his films in preview screenings, Walt intuitively understood how such an audience would react even before the film was made. He didn't study average Americans because he saw himself with his eighth grade education as an average American. He knew what they would like because he was one of them. Beyond this, Ryman could now see, there were other significant differences that separated the culture of Disney from that of MGM. At MGM, managers had supported the artistic development of their artists, though this support was primarily, if not wholly, in the service of film production. Disney, too, developed training programs to improve the abilities of their artists as it related to animation. But artists at Disney, more so than those at MGM, could sustain a dual life. Many artists at Disney created personal art which they exhibited at the studio and elsewhere. Some regularly took months of vacation to focus on personal projects. More so than other studio executives, Walt understood that the souls of artists needed to be nourished with individual pursuits and curiosity if they were to grow and develop as people. At Disney, artists had space for both their own art and for the art that contributed to cartoons. This, in turn, created a sense of loyalty, especially for longtime artists toward Walt and the studio, ultimately creating an environment where artists, grateful for this level of respect, wanted to deeply engage the production of an animated film. It was as closely knit group of workers working for a single goal as I have ever seen, Ryman said. You could say, what about MGM? What about 20th Century Fox? What about Warner Brothers? What about Paramount? 
Such a thing did not exist in any of these studios because those studios were presided over by mathematically minded statisticians and businessmen. They were there to make a business venture, and if this film would do it, that was the business venture. We always had the feeling that Walt, I'm sure this was a true feeling, wanted to make Paramount a quality production. These months toward the end of the 1930s represented a golden age at the Disney studio, a period where Walt directed his artists toward new goals. Pinocchio would be a tour de force in terms of both character animation and animated effects. Fantasia would seek to elevate animation into the world of high art, and Bambi would showcase a realistic presentation of animals that was far beyond anything in Snow White. During this period, Ryman purchased a one-acre ranch-style house in a new development just north of Los Angeles called Van Nuys. The house itself was surrounded by a few orange trees and strips of grass. Inside, though, it included a painter's studio with tall windows that let in natural light. Just as important, the house had space enough so that Herbie could invite his mother to live with him once she retired, allowing her to escape the harsh Illinois winters for the comfort of Southern California. In this, Ryman was moving into a new phase of his life, one with three parts. His life at the animation studio, his life at home as a fine arts painter, and his life with his mother and one of his sisters, as both Lucille and Cora would soon live in Los Angeles. In ways, this was a period of bliss, with the infighting of MGM now behind him. But there was trouble on the horizon. In Europe, Hitler and German troops had already invaded Poland and would soon move on to France and other parts of Europe. As a result, the number of theaters available to show American films was about to shrink. And inside the Disney organization, Walt watched as construction teams finished up his new studio, one located on the other side of town, in Burbank, roughly a mile from the Warner Brothers lot. The buildings there were designed as an ideal facility for Disney artists. But this, too, would create its own set of problems, issues that no one, not even Walt, could see as 1939 came to a close. I'll be back next Sunday with a new episode that continues our story of Disney artist Herb Ryman. As you know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney company. We are funded entirely by listener contributions. You can support our efforts by becoming a monthly Bandcamp subscriber. On Bandcamp, you'll find over a hundred episodes not available on iTunes or anywhere else. But the best reason to join is to support the work we do here. You can become a monthly subscriber at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. Until then, this is Todd James Pierce.